Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to look at a uh, uh, reposting the lecture on Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, for those of you that may need a refresher or if you were unable to see the discussion lecture earlier, uh, we're going to talk about Leonardo da Vinci. Now, Leonardo da Vinci uh, you know, comes out of, uh, you know, we talked about earlier about the the Gothic, that late medieval period where we talked about Florence and the importance of Florence and the development of the beginning of the Renaissance, where we had, without getting into too much, we had the bronze doors. Uh, we had Galberte building the bronze doors. We had Brunelleschi building the dome. And between the two of them, we have uh, the inklings, the beginning of linear perspective. And then when they unveiled the doors, you know, 14, 24, 14, 49, 48, uh, that marks the beginning of the Renaissance. And what we talked about, we talked about Masaccio being a young artist in Florence, uh, seeing these doors and seeing these bronze doors, he saw uh, interesting use of depth of field and some hints of linear perspective. This encourages Masaccio to write the, the principles of linear perspective, which we talked about in, a, in another video. So here we have the beginning of the Renaissance. We have Florence, we have the bronze doors. Now, Leonardo da Vinci himself was, was born of, uh, of a family just insisted of his mother. And, and back in those days, if you didn't have a father, if you were illegitimate, uh, let's per se, being born, you are about as low as you can get on the caste society. Uh, you are going to be low as low. Uh, there's really, it's going to be extremely difficult, if possible at all, for you to get any kind of education. You're not going to be able to marry the right people. You're not going to get the right jobs. You're not going to go to school. Uh, you, you're not going to get anything in life. As low as you can go. You're not going to have the opportunities. But Leonardo da Vinci, uh, <clears throat> he... Uh, he overcame all that. Uh, the fact that he, he wasn't taught how not to think, uh, he continued to, uh, uh, to grow uh, in knowledge. And here we have, uh, we have a self-portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. Now, Leonardo da Vinci is going to eventually uh, give us the painting, uh, the Mona Lisa. Now, when we think about Leonardo da Vinci, uh, I've always felt that, and along others, that Leonardo da Vinci uh, is a Renaissance man. And that means you're a genius at many different categories. You're just not smart in a lot of categories. You are at the top of your field. You're a genius at many categories. And Leonardo da Vinci was probably a genius at uh, five or six different categories. And uh, <clears throat> in the Mona Lisa, becomes historically maybe the most important piece of artwork ever made. Everything before the Mona Lisa is the ancient world and everything painted after the Mona Lisa is gonna be the modern world. Now, when they renovated the Louvre Museum in Paris, they were gonna spend 1.1 billion dollars originally to renovate the beautiful museum. It did a wonderful job. But someone offered almost half of that cost, almost half a billion dollars to pay for the renovations if they can purchase the Mona Lisa from the Louvre. And the Louvre obviously said no. You got to realize at the time that they offered almost half a billion dollars, $500 million dollars, the most expensive painting in the world at that time was a Vincent Van Gogh for about 10 million. So 10 million, almost 500 million. It was a huge increase there. Uh, and it was quickly denied. They did not do it. Now, why is this painting so important? There's a multiple different reasons. We're going to talk about those now. First of all, Leonardo da Vinci, when he, uh, he was an inventor, invented a lot of different things, uh, just a score of things which he did. Uh, but as far as the, uh, the artwork and the painting, 
It kind of crosses over some of his medical uh, research that he did. Leonardo da Vinci, when he, he, he did proportions of the human body, he did that because he understood the human body. He would purchase uh, you know, dead bodies from the morgue and he would take those bodies and he would look at the skin. He would draw the skin. He would take the skin off and he'd look at the cartilage. He'd look at the tendons and uh, ligaments, things like that. He would then take those off and look at the muscle structure, take that off and look at the bones. Uh, <clears throat> and he got to know the uh, the, the, the physical body intimately in drawing classes uh, in art school. You know, the first year you, you deal with still life, you're drawing still life, how to, how to shade, how to do line, how to actually physically draw. And then the second year of art school, you generally will, will draw, draw uh, live models where you have models come in and you would draw them. And then the third year of art school, what we did was we drew a lot of skeleton forms uh, we looked at the you know, the hand structure, the bone structure, and we got to know that. And that's what Leonardo da Vinci is doing here. He's uh, understanding the human body and what's underneath everything. He understood the uh, reproduction organs, basically. He also basically understood how the heart worked. And these drawings he has here shows that. He understood that the heart was a pump and that blood came in and blood was pushed out and it went through the body and his heart was a pump. He, he understood that the brain was a source of knowledge. He understood the, the lungs, the respiratory system, not completely, but he understood uh, certain basic principles. And understood some things about the eye. He didn't understand the reflecting light, but he understood some of the elements of the eyes and how they worked. So what happened was when, if you really fully understand you know, the bone structure and the muscle structure and all, the, all the, the things that go into making a hand a hand. If you understand what's underneath the skin, when you draw it, you know the proportions, you know the directions, you know how things are. So when you go to draw them, you have something like this. You have this beautiful rendition of the human hand. This is a study for a painting that he's going to do. So he's going to study the hand. He's going to draw it before he paints it. So if he for the first time, we have someone that knows so much about the human body that when a, a wealthy businessman is going to ask him to paint a portrait of his wife, Leonardo da Vinci simply paints the Mona Lisa here. So what the Mona Lisa symbolizes, symbolizes is the fact that he understood the body well enough to paint her exactly like she would have looked in real life. He paints her anatomically correct. Now, if you remember, a lot, a lot of the things in uh, when we think about the medieval period, remember all the faces were the same. The artists weren't trying to paint people what they looked like. They would paint them in, 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 in familiar surroundings. Uh, if it was an apostle, uh, you know, if it was Peter, there'd be a guy there with keys. That was also, that was Peter, he had the keys of the kingdom. Uh, if you had an individual with a fur coat on, uh, that was John the Baptist. So you, you painted things that were familiar to that person to be able to understand who it was. And now he's painting someone like they really do look. Here's a piece that came up a couple of years ago. It was understood to be a, a painting. Come here. 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 Come here.
one. Yeah, Mom, you there? All right, I'm recording right now. So when he wants to come in, yeah. Yeah, he's out there. You gonna come in again, Dad? You come in now. I just wouldn't be able to get up and get him. Okay. We're good. <clears throat> well, this painting was uh, for many years thought to be uh, a student of Leonardo da Vinci or a friend or, or someone in the area. They knew it was old. They knew it was from the Renaissance. And it's a, it's a painting of Christ. And what they're able to do a couple of years ago, they were able to get this painting, which had sold for, you know, 50, 60, 70, $80,000 because it was old, uh, but it was authenticated through uh, modern technology, through science, uh, that the actual paint was from the palette of Leonardo da Vinci or, or uh, some things like that. And um, so now it went for sale for a couple of years ago and it sold for a record 450 million dollars so uh this is now the most expensive piece of artwork out there leonardo da vinci uh that was uh found to be his so for for all these years it wasn't thought to be his just a, a note of okay now this piece right here uh is interesting in a couple different ways uh this right here has the mother mary and then it has the baby Jesus, and it's going to have Elizabeth, and, and it's going to have John the Baptist. Uh, this is a, a pencil charcoal drawing, and it's a beautiful piece. And you can see where Leonardo da Vinci is studying the ancient Greeks. We've talked about the Greeks. We talked about the use of form uh, in their sculpture, but how they would make uh, the, the, the human form under the fabric look almost translucent in the marble. And he sees that. If you look right here, you see how you have uh, the, the women's legs and the fabric and how elegant uh, that is. And it's a beautiful piece. Uh, I just happened to be in the, in the, in the uh, National Museum in London, England, uh, and I just left the museum. I just saw this piece uh, years ago, and I had just seen it. I left the museum as I was just shortly after I left the museum, someone walked in the museum a few minutes after I left and they shot, uh, they got a double barrel shotgun, they blew a big hole in it and it took them years and years and years to get all those little tiny fragments and stick them all back together and put it back together again. I understand it's now back <clears throat> in the museum, uh, but it was really frustrating to have something like that done. Okay, Leonardo da Vinci, if you notice that, <clears throat> his use of linear perspective, now, if you ask most people who is the first person to use linear perspective in their artwork, uh, most people that if they know, if they think they know who it is, they'll say Leonardo da Vinci because of this painting right here. But you know, Masaccio, you know, a whole generation earlier is going to be doing the tribute money and the Holy Trinity, where the Holy Trinity uh, all, it was the first time that you know, linear perspective was used properly. And so if you see here, your Holy Trinity is right here, where all the parallel lines go back right to, to one spot. And, and here, Leonardo da Vinci is doing the same thing. All parallel lines in the work all go to one spot right behind Christ's head. And you can see that. In this illustration right here, oh, in this illustration, uh, sorry, illustration right here, where you see all the parallel lines in this all move right behind Christ's head for linear perspective. I apologize uh, when I'm recording; it won't let me use my directional buttons. I have to use the my fingers on the pad, and sometimes it just doesn't work very good. I apologize. Okay, so here we have a more complex linear perspective that Leonardo da Vinci. This is a drawing for a painting that he's going to do. And uh, you can see where all the parallel lines, 
parallel lines all throughout this entire thing. And all the parallel lines are going to one spot. The, the complexity of these stairways, uh, stairs that are going up all go to one spot over there. Okay, we'll get away from the, you know, for as far as the painting and we're talking about some of the inventions. Some of the inventions he did, he actually physically made and some of the inventions were just drawn on paper. Uh, this one, he didn't actually physically make this, but what he's got is he's got a design for a tank. It has a uh, human power to it. It's got cannons all around it. It's, fortif it's a fortification, so bullets or something. If, if cannons hit it, it, it reflects off of it but it's kind of a design for a modern tank. Uh, and here we have uh, the design for that tank. Uh, we have a design for uh, a, a swirling blades around this gears right here that are drawn by horse, a, a flying apparatus, and we have a bicycle. We're gonna talk about those things here in a second. This right here is really interesting. You can get a bunch of sticks and put them in a configuration where you don't have to tie them together. You don't have to nail them together. But if you get the configuration right, you can build a bridge. And if you do that, you can actually build it and it has some strength. So you can actually build a bridge over a river or a ravine. If you wanted to, you'd be able to do that. He designed that. He designed many different kinds of bridges. This is one bridge that he designed. It doesn't look like much here. So this is looking straight down. And this is a river, and this is a boat going under the river. But here you have a side view of it. And then he writes about it and explains it. And when scientists looked at the drawings, then they read the writings about it. They figured out what he was talking about, and they actually built this bridge recently. This bridge right here, I've seen pictures of it with hundreds of people on it. It's very strong, very sturdy. And, and what the engineers did when they built this as they did it to his uh, specifications, they were blown away by how strong and structurally strong uh, the bridge was by using this configuration. They didn't realize it was gonna be as strong as it was. Uh, this piece right here deals with a pumping system. He understood the heart and how the heart pumped. He thinks about also about air. And here you got this individual here and you have a pumping system here. And what he did was these drawings show that your apparatus would be here and down here you would have a, you'd have a breathing helmet and you can actually go underwater and you can breathe. And this right here is uh, someone in modern days has built uh, what his drawings would have looked like. And uh, as far as, uh, uh, the pump and the breathing apparatus, how to do it. He didn't do this in particular, but he he also figured out if you got small tortoise shells and you put them in a solution for about three or four months, they would go translucent. And those tortoise shells would strap onto your head really nice and pull it. But he also did studies in optics and glasses and the, and the thickness of glasses and as far as uh, how we see and how we do things. This was a huge crossbow. Uh, my knowledge this was never built. Uh, it's not very feasible, but there are some things that were. This was, uh, these are mortar cannons. Uh, like if you have a, a regular cannon or that last object, that big crossbow, when someone's at a thousand yards, you can shoot it. If you have a cannon, you can shoot it at a thousand yards, let's say, or whatever distance. And what happens is, but as the enemy approaches and they're at a shorter distance, they don't come as accurate. So what happens is you can see the crank on the front on the front of these things. And what happens is as you change the trajectory of this cannon to go up, it'll go up and down and shorten the distance on which it lands. So you can continually change the range of the mortars that go up. It's just like in the modern movies when the guy's got the tube and they're, they're shooting someone and they throw something in the tube and poof, it goes up. Those are mortars, this is what this is. This is his design for mortar. Here's a design he has for a parachute. Um, this is in 1500. Uh, they didn't have any airplanes. They didn't have anything to jump out of, but yet 
he's designing that if man wanted to float down from somewhere, this is how you would do it. You also understand that in, in his drawings, look at the drawings right here. Everything's backwards. Yet Leonardo da Vinci was very, very secretive. He understood that if people knew what he was doing with some of the things he was doing, that he'd be a heretic and it would probably be illegal and they can probably execute him for what he's doing. And he knew and understand that. So whenever he drew notes, when he'd write down the notes, he actually drew them backwards. So if someone looked at it, they couldn't tell a normal person would just look at it and it's like some other language. But in reality, it would just be Italian, it would be reverse. So if you look into a mirror, as you look into it through a mirror, then you can read it. Uh, this piece right here is an odometer. What's really neat about this is that you, know, you get in your car and you drive and you see the odometer, and the miles will be clicking. He designed gears and designed this piece of equipment that if it was in a wagon, you'd be able to run the wagon and it would tell you how far you went. And uh, he actually worked on these and, and built these. This is kind of in the same vein. Uh, instead of for an engine for an automobile, they didn't have automobiles back then. Uh, he was building, building a gear system. It would be very similar to a gear system that you have on a bicycle. When you come to a hill, you downshift to a lower gear so you have more torque so you can go up the hill. <coughs> you get to the top of the hill and you go down the other side, you upshift your gear <coughs> so you can have to torque at a higher gear. What this is, is a modern transmission for an engine. So this is a gear system in which you can change gears for torque at different speeds. Now this has been used for like a windmill or, or, or a water paddle mill out of, out of, out of some kind of a, a mill uh, to do things with. There's different reasons to have different speeds for different mechanisms. But he was, he was thinking about that also. Also dealing with flight, it goes back to this kind of helicopter thing. Now, a lot of people say, well, the helicopter, he never did do it. He never thought about it. And quite honestly, this ain't gonna work. What was interesting about the spiral surface that rotated, it helped him eventually, he created the idea of the screw and how you can have torque by turning a screw into wood or something else in the ground or wood but through that screw, you can actually get torque. He designed all kinds of boats, but most of the boats had uh, a, a purpose and many of them were dredging boats. Uh, people go down rivers and their boats get stuck on sandbars and things like that. And you'd have to move all that dirt for boats to come through. It was very difficult to do, but he had multiple dredging uh, operation boats that he designed so uh, it can clear the causeways of, of uh, the boats as they pass through. Uh, this was a, a weapon of war. He designed a lot of weapons of war. He got commissions to do that. And uh, this is a uh, rotating blades that would cut people up pretty good uh, if it was used in battle. There's a front blade and a rear blade right here. Uh, he did self-defense systems for, uh, uh, for cities just a whole bunch of military stuff and a lot of other things also. But something I want to talk about here is that Leonardo da Vinci, you know, throughout his life, he was, he, he was always involved in flight. He loved the idea of flight, but the last, you know, seven, eight years of his life, he was completely immersed in flight. Uh, there's not that many drawings of Leonardo da Vinci, but the ones we do have, there's like over 500 drawings of birds in flight. And here we have some some birds here. What Leonardo da Vinci would do is he would he would light some fires, like a little fire pit, and put leaves and stuff in it and cause a lot of smoke. And then he would throw breadcrumbs out and, and birds would come down and they would fly down and he would see the smoke and how the smoke would go uh, around the wings. And he was trying to figure out how, how what made birds fly. And he also um, would go to the go to the the store and he would, the people would have birds and they'd probably eat them and things like that. And he would, he'd buy the birds and he would let them go so they can fly and be free and he can draw them. Uh, it was kind of known to be kind of crazy like that. Again, here's some more drawings of birds. He's explaining what's, 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 what, how they fly and how their bodies work and how the wings work. He studied, he studied the wings. 
but that's not what was important. What was really important was, you know, 400 years after Leonardo da Vinci uh, lived, uh, the Wright brothers did. And, and there was a gentleman that, that figured this out right before the Wright brothers, but the fact and idea that you understand lift is what allows something to fly. Like for instance, if an airplane is going down the runway and you get a certain speed up, when you turn the wings up, that's not what makes it fly. The flaps on the wings can help with some lift, but generally they're for steering. So what happens is to know and understand that when a wing goes through, when an, an airplane's going down the runway and the wings going down the runway, he understood that when air hits the front of the wing, the air will split and the air that split will meet its buddy on the back side. And that's illustrated here. When the streamline, when the air hits the front of the wing, this is the wing. When it hits the front of the wing, air splits here and air will split here. Let's, let's call these guys buddy. This is like buddy air. So these two buddies right here, they hit right here, they split, they split, they split. And the buddies that were here will meet right here. So when the air splits, the same air will meet on the back side. Now, if a wing has a curved top and a relatively flat bottom, the curved surface is a longer surface. So for the buddies to split and for the same buddies to meet, the air on the top has to move quicker to meet its buddy. The air on the bottom has to slow down to meet its buddy who's going a longer distance. And when you have air that splits and does that, and you have this fast moving air, the slow moving air, what happens is that creates pressure. High pressure down here, low pressure up there, and it pushes up on a wing. And you'll notice when you're on an airplane, next time you go to you fly somewhere, sit by a window and, and look at the wings. You'll notice that as the airplane is going down the runway, the wings are all bouncing and floppy. And all of a sudden at a certain speed, the wings get stable, they stop vibrating, they're just there because there's already a little bit of pressure holding them up. And then when it gets going a little bit faster, a little bit faster, all of a sudden you see the wings go, whoop, <laughs> they get pushed up. And then a little faster, you'll see the whole plane go up. And then the flaps will also help with some of the lift and the flaps also do the, uh, the steering. But it's basically the lift the upward pressure on the wing that makes him fly. And Leonardo da Vinci writes about this. He knew about lift, he understood it. He would watch the birds, he'd see the smoke on their wings and what happens to it. And he really figured this out. So Leonardo da Vinci uh, built all kinds of flying machines and, 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 and in some of his writings, he, he writes about a flying machine that he designed and how he designed it and then he, talks about building it. And then he talks about taking it outside Hill, outside Florence, and he's gonna try his flying machine. It was late in his life, and he uh, never really talked about it before, ever again after that. And so what happens is scientists uh, took his plans and used only materials that he had available to him back in 1503, 04. And, and they went and they rebuilt his flying machine exactly to the stats, to the statistics that he wanted, the specs that he wanted. And then they took it outside the same hill uh, in Italy and they actually flew. So the conclusion of the scientists that did this, and it would seem like it was about 25 years ago, uh, the scientists that did this uh, came to the conclusion that there was probably about a 50-50 shot that exactly 400 years before the Wright brothers that Leonardo da Vinci actually flew. And a lot of them really do believe that. So here we have Leonardo da Vinci among many, 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 many things that he did. He really understood the human body. That was so important to uh, his work and what he was doing. He 
would understand the eye and the structure of the body and what was going on. So therefore, when he when he figured out what was with the body, he was able to paint the body, understand the body, and then when he would then draw the body, he knew what was underneath the skin. So here's a beautiful image. This is a a, a, a charcoal that was made for a painting. This is actually a, a detail of a large painting. But the fact that he understands human anatomy as well as he does, he can even drape this body with this fabric and just bring out the beautiful imagery of the human form underneath it. And because he is able to do that, he's able to, when again, when a wealthy merchant asks him to paint his wife, he is ap he's, uh, able to paint her in exactly how she was. And again, this brings us to a point. During the Renaissance, the artist understood that we are real people in the real world. And as a viewer of artwork, we have a brain, we have an eye, and we have our own opinion. Before the Renaissance, people were not individualized. The Renaissance becomes very humanitarian to the point where they understand the unique ability of every individual person having their opinions. So what happens is with Masaccio, he did linear perspective. So things look right when a human being looked at it. Leonardo da Vinci did linear perspective, but he also did the human form. So when you looked at it, it looked like it did in the real world. And then you have Michelangelo who's gonna be doing his thing. But each of the artists are going to do artwork so that you in the real world with your unique view of the world are able to see things from your own perspective. And it makes the viewer for the first time in art history, the, the viewer is important. Uh, not as, as important as the work itself and the artist himself of what's going on. So that gives us a very quick, quick, quick sketch on Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, thank you very much.